Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Oh, there's lots of people here today. Super excited. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. I am my name is Daisy. I help manage the seed library here at the Central Library um, for the Dallas Public Library. How many times can I say library? <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about composting with Lauren Clark, who is the founder of TURN, a DFW-based environmental service that takes common food waste and turns it into compost for use in gardens and on farms. She's a certified Dallas County Master Gardener and a composting specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife and a United States Composting Council Educated Compost Facility Operator. So we're learning from the best. <laughs> um, just a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your mics on mute during the presentation. If you have a question for our presenter, go ahead and use the um, raise hand button for Zoom or type your questions into the chat. I'm gonna be monitoring them so that we can um, ask questions in real time. So if everybody's ready, Lauren, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Happy fall. Happy cooler weather, thank goodness. I'm gonna share my screen here. Pull this guy up. All right, can everyone see this all right? Yes, yes. Thank you. hey, thanks Jayla. Well, it's a pleasure to be with y'all today. Thank you so much to um, the city of Dallas and the Dallas Public Library for this opportunity. Um, yes, I am very passionate about plants, composting, gardening, cooking. Um, that's essentially how I came to start a business called Turn. Um, five years ago and it's been a fun wild ride um i came across this passion because um for composting because as a master gardener i recognize the value of compost and then um when i was going to culinary school and i got a culinary degree at el centro um i realized uh that there's so much food that's thrown away so um i am a mother to two um i have backyard chickens. In fact, I just took one from an egg from the, the coop. <laughs> um, I want this to be a fun and interactive and educational discussion collaboration um, today. So feel free again to type any questions in the chat. Um, I'd love for us to talk about anything that you guys want to talk about, but the concept of what I wanted to go through today is called gold for the garden. So if you think about um, planting something and growing it, and then cooking it. And then hopefully the end result with what you're doing with that is composting it. So we're starting at the very end point. We're starting with the gold, which is the compost. Um, let me see. That's me. <laughs> um, this is again, a little bit about our, our company. We have um, clients, uh, residential clients all over DFW. Um, and you can learn more about that on our website, turncompost.com. Um, we're also embarking on some really exciting initiatives for composting um, with the city of Dallas, and we work with the city of Plano and Dave W. Airport. So we do composting um, on a larger scale for larger clients, um, but really my passion is uh, composting and educating people in their homes and inspiring you all to do it yourself. So everything you see in this presentation is... Um, something that I've done myself. And that's very important to me because I don't believe in teaching something that I haven't personally experienced. So um, that being said, um, any questions that I don't know the answer to, I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Also um, along the way in the process of growing your own food, cooking your own food and composting it, there are going to be mistakes. I've made mistakes too. So um, my goal in this is to, to inspire you and let's just get going. All right, so we're gonna talk first about the gold, which are the basics of composting. That's my kind of my favorite thing to talk about because I've gone 
um, to professional levels of, of learning the process. We're gonna talk about what it is, why it's important, how it works, like the basic science, some different methodologies for you guys to try it at home, and then some final thoughts. And then I'd like to inspire you guys um, also to think about what you can be planting in your garden. Um, and just to know, I just would love to know from how many of you with some signals, how many of you are currently um, composting and how many of you are currently um, growing your own food? Let me ask the first question. How many of you compost at home right now? Maybe um, one of the moderators can tell me the numbers on that. Just wave a hand or thumbs up. All right. And then how many of you guys are gardening at home? How, are you growing your own vegetables? Are you growing your own herbs? All right. And I assume you all are cooking or you love to eat. And we'll talk about some things that I'm I'm cooking right now for my garden as well in a second. So I saw two thumbs up for um, composting. And then it looks like I had three people say that they were growing their own food. Awesome. Well, I hope today will be fun for you guys. And um, again, this is just an open discussion. So let's talk first about the composting. Thanks for you guys who are composting at home. Um, what is compost? All right. Um, compost is organic materials that have decomposed to create a stable soil product that feeds plants. All right, that's it in that shell. That's what you see is finished compost. Um, why is it important? There are so many reasons, environmental reasons, um, approximately 30. In fact, most statistics nationally, um, globally and locally say that 40% of what goes into landfills is food waste. Um, and composting reduces that strain um, on the environment because when food waste goes into the landfill, it produces methane gas. And the UN Environment Program has said that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest consider of methane um, into our atmosphere behind China and the US. Uh, methane is much, much more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon. And again, food is the single largest waste stream item in the US waste stream. Um, what is the value of compost? Aside from mitigating the problems, it rebuilds our soil, it improves soil structure, drainage, aeration, and more moisture holding capacity. Um, it provide, provides nutrients that modify and stable soil pH and promote plant growth. So healthy soil equals healthy plants that equals healthy food that can feed hopefully people. Now there's an important distinction, compost is not fertilizer. Good compost should have a ton of um, nutrients in it um, that are a rainbow of nutrients. Fertilizer is meant to replace certain missing links in the chain of nutrients that your plants might need. So that's an important distinction when we're talking about compost versus regular, so regular soil. And that's why a lot of people call compost gold or black gold. Um, another reason why you should be composting at home if you're not already is that you can apply compost to everything in your growing space. It can be um, your grass, it can be your shrubs, your trees, your vegetable gardens for sure. And there's a theory out there that if you're regularly applying compost to your spaces, you should be saving money on water, for instance, because of that moisture holding capacity, okay? You should be not having to pay for expensive fertilizers if you're regularly applying compost to your urban space. And so typically it's recommended that you apply some compost in the fall and then some in the spring. All right, let's talk next about the soil food web. Um, and this is something I like to show everybody when we're talking about soil um, and plants and growth, because the point of this, and this is published by the USDA, um, hold on one second, pardon me guys. So since a few people have joined us, just a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, we are also recording today's program and we'll send that recording out afterwards. All right, sorry about that. Um, I work from home, so you might hear dogs in the background. Um, 
There are four basic ingredients that go into compost and they are brown stuff, green stuff, air and water. And if you don't remember anything else about this presentation, think about a recipe. Those are the four main ingredients that you want in your compost recipe. Brown stuff, green stuff, air and water. Let's talk about the brown stuff. The brown stuff is carbon, all right? That represents carbon. Leaves, pine needles, dried plants, hay, wood chips, and shredded paper are carbon sources. Now, I'm actually the kind of person who actually shreds my paper and puts it in my compost. Right now, you're gonna to start to see a lot of leaves in your um, urban space and perhaps some hay bales from Halloween decorations. Those things are not considered trash. Those things are considered resources. And so I want to change your ideas about what those things are considered as waste into resources. The second ingredient that you're gonna want into compost is nitrogen, and that's green stuff, like food scraps, grass clippings, fresh living plants. Even though manure and coffee grinds are brown, those are actually nitrogen sources. On the right-hand side here, you're going to see a bucket of food scraps that we collect with from term. Look at how much great food there is thrown away. The, again, food is not should not be thrown away. It's considered a resource. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about food scraps what should and should not go into your urban space. Um, everyone take a quick look at this. Generally speaking, if you're composting at home, there are some yeses and there are some nos. Now, if you're composting, there's different ways that you can compost some of the nos, which we're gonna talk about in a second. But in general, if you're just doing an outdoor method, here are some of the things that you can do. They are the obvious things like veggie and fruit scraps, breads, grains, pastas, eggshells, coffee grounds, and beans, nuts, and seeds. You wanna stay away from pet waste, lots of heavy liquids, meat, fish, and bones, definitely no glass, metal, or plastic. All right, the third ingredient is water, H2O. So whenever you're putting in the carbon and the nitrogen, the, grounds and the, the browns and the greens, you're gonna to wanna to be sure that you have water after each layer, hypothetically. Um, you want your compost to be moist like a sponge, but not like a wet towel. And the Technical U.S. Composting Council um, recommendation for moisture level is 45 to 60%. Um, water is required for the microbes that you saw on the soil food web to start to decompose and for that life process to happen. All right, so um, this summer was absolutely miserable for all of us, and I was very diligent in my um, home um, to keep watering my uh, compost. So it's important when you think about starting that you have a reliable water source close to your compost space. All right, the fourth ingredient is air. Um, one of the reasons why my company is called Turn. All right, turning your compost inserts air into the mixture and speeds up the decomposition rate. And here's another thing, the smaller the materials, the faster the decomposition rate because when you chop things down and when they're smaller, like if you wanna shred your leaves or chop up your vegetables, you're creating more surface area or oxygen for your compost area. And also maintaining a well oxygenated compost pile will reduce foul odors, which none of us want in our urban space. <laughs> All right, now that we've talked about the four- hey, Lauren? Yeah. I have a question from the chat. Sure. Um, this was about some of the previous slides. Just chicken waste count as pet waste? That's a great question. I personally, and this, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to doing things in an urban setting. I do mix in my um, chicken uh, manure into my compost. It's a great nutrient. So that's a, a great question. When I'm talking about pet waste, I'm talking about cat and dog waste. So chickens are a different matter. Um, I feed my chickens organic uh, pellets and I feed them my chicken food scraps from the kitchen. So everything they have, I know is coming out correctly. When we're talking about pet waste. We're talking about, you know, dog poop. Um, it will have, could have certain, you know, things that they've taken at the vet or certain medicines. You don't know what's in there. So generally speaking, you, that's why you want to avoid um, the dog and the cat waste. Does that answer the question? I think so. And then we've got another one. This is for, um, so I have more than a dozen bags of shredded leaves from last fall and lots of coffee grounds from a coffee shop. 
What is the best way to measure volume to get the proper mix for composting just the two? And what is the best way to incorporate grounds alone into the garden soil? Okay, great. I think this next slide will help a little bit um, because we're going to talk about not just the materials, those four ingredients that are in there, but the quantity and quality of those materials. Hypothetically, you're going to need enough mass. And so, you know, the Master Gardener Program or USCC will recommend urban composting. You're going to need something three by three or four by four to start. And that's just because it allows enough materials to go in for biological and chemical activity to start. Um, now, this is very important, this last bullet here. There is a CN ratio, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to one that's recommended. What that means and what a lot of people do is they do not have enough brown materials in their compost. So the most effective decomposition ratio is 30 to one. And you can see by this um, uh, graph on the right-hand side, about the days of decomposition based on those ratios. So we'll talk in a little bit about the coffee grounds and the leaves because and what I like to tell people when they're starting out composting is start simple. Start with just something like your leaves. Um, and I'll show you something in a couple of minutes that's gonna be pretty cool about that. All right, so we're gonna talk now about different composting methods. Um, and this is stuff that I learned through my master gardener training um, as a specialist with Texas A&M. And again, I've tried all of this because some of it sounded so like blatantly obvious or I don't know what to say, pedestrian, <laughs> which is a good uh, pun for this one, but there's a thing called walkway composting, all right? So leaves should not be wasted. Um, there's a thing called walkway composting and that is just put your leaves, especially now they're starting to fall in places where you might be walking. In my yard, uh, side yard, I have an area Next to the chicken coop, I have a huge oak tree and there's a ton of leaves. And whatever I don't put my compost, I leave some of them there. Leave, leave, sorry for again for the pun. And I walk over them and I just let them rot and decompress. And in the springtime, I scoop all that good stuff out and I either put it back in my garden beds or I put it back in my compost. So there's a method here called walkway composting. Sheet composting is probably something that you guys have maybe heard about. And that basically means, again, nature will take care of itself. If you keep adding brown materials or green materials, uh, especially brown materials, um, to your compost, this is one of picture of my vegetable bed, um, they're just going to break down eventually. Compost will happen. Rot will happen. And those microorganisms that you saw in the soil food web, when you're adding those materials to the soil, they are loving it because it's food for them. All right, so this is a picture of my uh, one of my vegetable beds in the backyard during winter. It looks like, yeah, the garlic is coming up, but I put some branches in there. I put some leaves in there. There looks like a partially dead flower arrangement. Um, it look, doesn't look great right now, right? But in the springtime, in the summer, this was what that bed turned into. Um, here's some amaranth, here's some cucumbers. That year, I think I grew, tried to grow corn. So. What it may look like when you're adding the compost or when you're adding or raw organic materials um, may not look great in the beginning, but if you let it settle over time, um, it will turn into something great. Again, that's feeding the soil. All right, now here's another methodology for you guys. Um, not necessarily one that I would be recommending in your urban environment. And I know that because I have two dogs that you guys just heard in the background, but there is such a thing as a compost pocket. And again, if you wanted to dig a hole, and I have fruit trees in my backyard, so I've done this, um, in places where I don't feel like maybe there's enough nutrients happening and I'm not adding enough fertilizer, you can literally dig um, a hole at least 12 to inches deep and bury those food scraps. Again, you're just feeding the microbes and feeding the soil, and you're only adding another organic layer to your soil. Um, word to the wise, and again, I learned this the hard way because it's always a process, there's always mistakes, um, one time I did this and I did not bury it deep enough and I have two cocker spaniels and one of them, boom, found it real fast. So if you try this at home or somewhere, be sure that you really properly bury the food scraps. Let's talk about the heap method of composting, all right? There's generally speaking two different dimensions here. One is a slow method, a static method, and one is a faster method or a windrow method. The left-hand side is one of our community composting spaces that we used to be at. Um, and what you see there is 
uh, the brown stuff, you see some green stuff mixed in. Do you see the heat coming from that middle pile? That one is really cooking. That one is really cooking. And so that um, all those four ingredients, when they come together in the right way, are going to start cooking. And we'll talk about mass in just a second. Now, the right-hand side is the windrow method. And this is what you'll see at uh, commercial facilities. There are windrow machines. They're very expensive. They're creating rows. And they have a machine that's just constantly turning them. So the slow method, if you do it at home and don't do anything, you can get finished compost within about six months. If you're constantly turning it or activating it more, as most commercial facilities do, you can get windrow compost in three months time. So again, this is kind of going back to you guys, like how much time do you want to spend on it? Um, what different ways do you want to do it at home? But remember, it always goes back to those four main ingredients, the carbon, the nitrogen, the water, and the air. All right, this is my favorite way to explain. And my favorite method for um, composting at home is creating your own container. Um, that's me on the left-hand side nerding out at U.S. Composting Council training because they make you, make you actually make your own recipe and you break up into teams. Um, and they, over a week, monitor the temperatures and you see which team is going to win based on how much, um, heat you had and then how much, uh, was reduced. Um, the second one, I think there was a question, this second picture, there was a question about leaves and there's a whole theory with just composting leaves. So you can just go very simple, get some, um, hard wire from Ace Hardware or Home Depot, um, and create a cylindrical bin or a square bin and just compost your leaves and the coffee grinds. That will break down over time. And that's generally a more um, fungal focused uh, type of compost, but it will work. If you're big into D DIY, you can use pallets um, and you can create your own bin. Um, very popular are things called tumblers. And that's one that I have still on the right-hand side in my backyard. A lot of people are sold this and like it because they're afraid of um, rodents, unwanted creatures, smells, etc. I'm not the hugest fan of this method because I can't really always tell what's going on inside in terms of the water and the air. And the other thing I like to remind people is that what goes in must come out. <laughs> okay. So if you want to do the tumbler method, just remember it's like a big old wheel of fortune. All right. It's going to get heavy. And you're putting stuff in there and it's fun when you do it, but you still have to get it out at some point. Um, but that's still a totally viable way to compost at home, especially if you're worried about um, rats, possums, things like that, that we have. All right, now here's another container method. And this is perhaps my favorite one. It's a square bin. I have this in my side yard too. It's called a shepherd's bin. You can buy it for like 30 or 40 bucks on Amazon or um, hardware store. And essentially, um, I like this because it's letting the air come in. It's directly connected to the earth. Um, and you just keep adding the layers, watering them. I show this picture because it's a little bit funny. Um, I had this gorgeous squash, um, acorn squash grow out one year from that compost pile even though I've never been able to successfully grow acorn squash myself, <laughs> the compost did it. And I harvested six beautiful ones and yes, I ate them. So those things can happen. Um, in fact, it happened to me when I started composting some watermelon or pumpkin seeds and I planted them in my backyard. So that can happen and that's okay. All right, here's another picture of the container method. And again, the question about what do I do with all my leaves? I would suggest and recommend that you, this is what I built myself, um, just using some chicken wire from Ace Hardware. And over the year, I don't waste my leaves. I just keep piling them into this. And um, what's happening is the earthworms and all those microbes and everything are coming up and they're just going to continue to eat and feed off this stuff. You can see I have some hay in there because I have chickens, all right? So it's pretty miraculous. Um, I was told this method uh, would turn your compost, even if you just le did leaves and water into a compost cake. And basically by over a year, it's a very slow method. Things are just gonna keep compressing. 
the earthworms are going to keep eating everything and all those microbes. And then you're going to have finished compost on the inside. So I had to try it myself. So this is what I did. And you can see when you start to dig in the middle, there's going to be finished compost there. And what happened after this is I ended up cracking open that um, cylindrical container and I harvested basically a whole uh, wheelbarrow full of finished compost. So um, all of this to say, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Just keep remembering the four ingredients. Try to remember the CN ratio. You always need a lot of browns um, and you need that water. All right, now this is an interesting uh, method of composting called oogle culture, um, which means literally the pathway of the forest. And I love this method because it's a way to basically use decaying wood, which we have storms and a lot of people like to put the wood out in their bulk and brush. Well, guess what? There's a way that you can stack that wood um, and you'll see in the left-hand side, there's a proper way to do that. Um, and then you keep adding to it leaves, smaller items. You start with the bulkier items at the front on the bottom, and then you add the smaller items at the top. And then um, you'll, what you'll see in the middle is a picture from Austria of how they grew uh, raised vegetable beds using this method. On the right-hand side picture, again, I did this myself with a couple of Christmas trees, some downed limbs, um, and I just kept adding organic material to it. And then the next season, I basically had a, a full growing vegetable bed there. So um, let's not think about our wood and our limbs as trash or waste. Again, they are resources. All right, I'm lightly touching on all of this because I wanna give you guys just a smattering of some options. Uh, vermicomposting is such a cool way to compost. Um, now there's you know the expensive way you can do it with some trays and you can order the kits online. Um, which is what you see on the right hand side, or you can do the simple method with a Rubbermaid bin, drill some holes in it, add some shredded paper. Um, what's important about this method is that you need the right worms. Um, and typically red wiggler worms are the most popular ones that you can order on Amazon. And so over time, you're again, creating compost by this. Now this will create something called worm castings, which is an even more nutrient dense um, output for the compost team. All right, Bakashi method. Now, let's say that you're all in and you wanna be adding meats and dairies and doing everything to your compost. Um, the Bakashi method will allow you to do that. You can order the brand on Amazon. Um, what happens is that this Bakashi um, brand will chemically break down food waste so that you can technically put it back in your garden within two to three weeks. So this is a fast, rapid method. It is anaerobic. Um, typically speaking, meaning that oxygen is not required for the material to decompose. All right, I always go from the most simple one to the grossest method or the most like interesting one. <laughs> and again, this is what I've done myself, um, but this is the black soldier fly um, larvae method um, or BSF. And if you've never researched BSF, just Google, hopefully not while you're eating lunch, um, black soldier flies consuming a McDonald's cheeseburger. It is miraculous that these guys can eat so much so quickly and they love everything. They'll eat your leftover Mexican food, greasy pizza. Um, I ordered this biopod um, because I have chickens. And so again, these black soldier flies as the larvae pupate, they climb out of this machine and then they become an animal uh, protein source for animals such as chickens. So um, I did this for a while with my chickens. They loved it. Um, and so this is a really fascinating new way that um, big companies are researching a way to not just reduce food waste, but also to feed animals. So um, if you really want to nerd out on this, check out Black Soldier Flies. Um, again, final thoughts on composting. I just gave you guys a huge picture, sort of about the science, some methodologies. Don't strive for per perfection, just get going. Uh, you're going to learn as you go. I've made mistakes. You can always adjust your te techniques as needed. Just remember those four main ingredients. There are so many resources out there. You can get super creative. But again, I want to encourage you to use everything around you in your ur natural urban space. I like to say that my, my kitchen and my yard are both zero waste. I don't waste anything out my yard. I don't waste anything in my kitchen that comes from food. 
So I'm going to pause right there. Any questions about that before we go to the garden section? Um, I have one question in the chat regarding Hugo culture. I just got a massive delivery of wood chips. Would that be a good base for the mounds, even if it's not whole logs? Technically, um, it would not be a good base. I'm going to say this just because those bigger logs, what's happening is as they decompose, they're ad adding continual moisture and nutrients to the pile. So with your having mulch and it just being so small, I'm concerned that you wouldn't have a proper base for it. Um, so I would not recommend that. You could create hypothetically a growing space out of mulch, but I guess it depends on how much you want to grow. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but the whole point of ugu culture is, again, this. So if you're really interested in this method, please um, look up ugu culture. There's a ton of resources out there. Um, it's one of the major tenets of permaculture, and there is a methodology for doing that. Any more questions before we move on? Mm, looks like we're good. All right. So let's talk about um, part two, which is the garden and herbs. Um, and I'm going to do a run through of my favorite perennial herbs and some annual ones. You know, fall is, the gr is a great time to plant perennials. Um, and let's talk about what that means. Perennial means that the plant lives year round throughout all growing seasons. Some perennials are evergreen, but some of them will die back in the winter and you need to prune them back, but they'll start growing again in the spring. Annuals means that things live for one season or year. Um, there's another important term here when you're thinking about gardening um, and that is varieties, all right? Subcategories of the parent herb with various flavor profiles and hardiness characteristics. Um, I'm a nerd, and so I am always trying every year different types of um, varieties of, of herbs, um, and especially because I love cooking, there are so many different um, insinuations for how you can change the flavor pro profile of something based on um, um, how it tastes, you know, the texture. Let's talk about some physical and sensory descriptors. You can categorize or describe these things. And I like to help parents and encourage parents at home to really start working with your kids and your whole family about smelling things. What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Use all your five senses um, to feel and understand the plant. And then obviously the taste aspect to it. All right. Now, everybody needs to know this, that um, you cannot necessarily and should not necessarily grow all things in Dallas, Texas. We are in a very specific USDA hardiness zone called 8A, all right? The other thing you want to think about, obviously, when you're starting to grow something is, does it need sun or does it prefer shade? What are the water requirements? Are you going to mulch it well? Um, here's another thing to think about. Does it produce flowers for pollinators? Um, will it attract beneficial insects? Think about the aesthetics. Um, here are a few different ways that I've done um, and grown herbs and vegetables in my space. Um, the left-hand side, you'll see there's a ded dedicated area, a little kitchen garden. Um, container gardening is fantastic, especially if you have an apartment or a studio or a small space. You can do a lot in one pot. Um, in this middle one, I see chives, oregano, thyme, and rosemary. And then the last picture is something that's kind of my favorite style of, of gardening at home, and that's a hybrid approach. So I have some herbs in there. Um, I have some native plants. Um, it looks fun. It, it has texture, it has color. So be as creative as you want to, based on what you have available to you. All right, we're gonna get into uh, the basics of what I recommend to be grown in our area. This is rosemary. It's very, very hard to kill rosemary. Um, however, this, you know, last summer and the last winter was absolutely brutal, brutal and I lost my rosemary. Um, but if I could recommend um, one or two or three or four herbs, rosemary would be at the top of the list. Thyme. Again, there's so many different varieties of thyme. I just harvested some from my garden. 
Um, and there's lots of different flavors. There's lemon thyme. Um, again, it's a classic. It's, and if you like cooking, rosemary, thyme, oregano, so many possibilities here. I just harvested some oregano, Italian oregano from my backyard. Um, on the right hand side is um, Mexican oregano, and that has a totally different flavor profile. All right. But oregano is a great hearty herb to grow in our zone in DFW. Chives. Wonderful. Again, I just harvested some. They smell so good. In fact, if those of you are gardening right now, I bet your chives are blooming and the bees are loving it. Um, so an easy thing to grow. Um, I have many chive plants in my yard. And the reason for that is, and just words the wise, um, if you let the bulbs flower and go to seed, you're going to have a lot of little friend chives all over your yard. So just watch out for that. But chives are an easy thing to grow um, and cook with all year long. All right. Sage is another great thing to grow. Um, and this is a different, uh, I think it's a lemon variety of sage. Mint. All right. Mint is easily grown here, but um, please be careful to keep your mint in a pot. If you, mint is a very vigorously growing plant. Again, there are a ton of fun varieties. Um, I've tried chocolate mint, I've done lemon mint. Um, there's just so many things that you can do with that, but be careful because it, it, it will grow vigorously and take over a space in your yard. And this is a fun thing called wintry savory. It's a little bit halfway between rosemary and, and thyme, I like to think. Um, and again, it's great in soups and now it's fall time. So this is a great plant to have and grow. Um, it's great on roasted chicken. So lots of great uses for this. And also look at the flowers. So pollinators are going to like that. Lavender is, um, uh, something that can grow well, if as long here, as long as you have the right variety. Um, I've had good luck with Spanish or Goodwin Creek. I haven't had good luck with the French varieties. Again, it has to do with what works best best in our climate and our local climate. Um, and I like to also encourage folks when you're thinking about starting a garden is to go to a local nursery if you can um, and not just pick up stuff from Home Depot because they order in bulk and not necessarily for our region. So, you know, some of my favorite gardens are North Haven, Redentas, um, the people there are very knowledgeable about what works well in our region, and they're not going to lie to you to try to sell stuff. They're going to say, nope, don't do that. So just be careful when you think about trying new plants to be sure it works well in our area. Tarragon. Okay. This is another, um, perennial herb. Now it does die back, but what's amazing, um, is that, uh, it grows back every year. It's very vigorous. Um, French tarragon does not grow well here. Um, this is a particular, particular type of variety called Mexican mint marigold. Um, I love it. The licorice flavor is fantastic, especially when dried. Um, and some people say that the orange flowers that it creates are the first sign of fall or colder weather. So, um, again, this is another great thing to try in your yard. Here's a surprising one. Um, horseradish. This is a horseradish plant that I planted. Um, some people would call it a weed because it grows very vigorously, but I have harvested the roots. Um, you can chop the leaves for a very, very fine flavor. Um, and I've harvested a ton of um, horseradish roots over, over the years. Um, same thing with turmeric. That can also go well here. Um, so I'll just stop with that. All right, let's talk about harvesting. I know we're at 1243. Um, you want to be careful that when you're harvesting herbs, you want to hopefully do it in the early part of the day before the heat. Um, when things go to flower, they're sending the, the power to the flower. So if you can harvest before they flower, that's the maximum flavor you're going to have for your cooking, unless you want to feed pollinators. And I usually do half and half. I usually let some of my plants go to flower for the pollinators and then um, I clip off things in the morning, like I've just done, um, and I cook with them. This is some lemon, lemon basil that I just, um, cut off, but it has some flowers right now. So I'm the kind of person that kind of thinks about both the pollinators and then also what I want to harvest and cook at home. 
Um, please be sure that when you're harvesting, you use clean and sharp tools to limit damage to the plant and also limit infection to the plant. All right, storage and use. Um, I go a little crazy with dehydrating. There's a ton of different ways to do that. I love this picture. It's so beautiful, so po poetic, but I do the same thing. I just get some twine, some cooking twine. Um, I wrap it around the bunch of herbs and I dry them in my kitchen. Um, you do want it in a similar to cool, dry space. Um, I like the way they look. Um, it smells really good. You can also oven, oven dry them in ambient or leftover temperature. So you can, once you have stopped cooking, your oven goes down to about 180 at lowest. And if you lay them flat on a sheet pan, they will dehydrate that way. And then of course I have my grandmother's electric dehydrator. Um, so that's another way to do it. Um, there's so many ways that you can use um, and store herbs throughout the year. And if you're already growing them, start thinking now about harvesting them for the fall. Um, so I'm going to stop right there. The other thing I wanted to tell you guys is, um, and then I'd love to open this up for discussion and questions. Um, right now I'm harvesting a ton of eggplant in my garden. Um, I love this. This was a Chinese um, eggplant and I'm still getting like dozens of them. Getting a lot of peppers. Um, I'm getting a lot of okra. Um, and my tomato plants are struggling a little bit, but they're coming on their way. <laughs> Again, it's not perfection, it's progress. And we certainly have had a very challenging summer and fall um, so far. So I think now is just a beautiful time to be thinking about planting and growing. Um, and I'm just going to stop right there. It's 1246. Um, are there any comments, questions, thoughts, or any discussion items that you guys want to bring up? So we have a couple from your presentation. Um, where did you find the horseradish and turmeric plants locally? I'm not going to lie. Um, I got them from the grocery store. So I got turmeric from the grocery store and... Um, they have some roots on it. So I watered them. I put them in water and the same thing with the horseradish. I mean, that's a great way to get new plants. Yeah. You can buy them of course at the specialty stores, or you can try and harvest. It's just up to you. It's how much time do you want to take? You can also order things online through a lot of great, you know, specialty stores, but that's what I did personally. And it worked fine. Awesome. Um, Danielle's asking, what are you planting now? That's a great question. I'm planting beans. I'm planting um, more herbs. Um, I, to be honest, it's been kind of a hard summer. So uh, my sweet potato crop was an abject failure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm focusing on some staples like beans, um, just some very simple things like that. Um, but nothing crazy right now because of time constraints. And also I'm, I really waited a long time to plant because it, things have been so hot. So I'd love to know what everybody else is planting right now. Okay. Um, while we wait for those to come in, in the chat, I've got a question about the best way to apply compost to the garden. Should they spread on top um, or the bottom of a hole? Yeah, the recommendation is generally... Um, a one to two inch layer every every growing season, every fall and every spring, and mix that in with your soil. Um, if you're applying compost to grass, that's an entirely different matter. Um, so again, just generally speaking, mixing in some with your existing soil or around certain plants that you really love is the way to go. Unless you're applying to grass, you wanna be sure that your grass is aerated. Um, you can get an aeration machine um, or if go in school, old school cleats. Um, but the problem with applying compost to grass, um, is that you don't want your grass to thatch. So you don't want it to get too compounded the soil beneath it. Um, so, uh, you're probably asking more about the former, about how do you feed your plants? And so generally you're going to want to mix it in the soil around your plants. All right, next question. Which herbs are best to grow now? Yes, I have right now um, everything that I talked to you guys about. So 
Again, I focused on perennial herbs. So those are things that should go year round. Um, so I would just go back to this. There are so many great resources and I have to give a shout out to Texas A&M AgriLife because um, if you want any guides on what to plant now, um, they have downloadable PDFs for vegetables. Um, but yeah, all of the things that I showed you right now are things that can be grown out and they will grow back. I, I will start now. I'm also going to be planting garlic soon because garlic is usually October, November, and then you harvest around May or June. So that's another thing I'm thinking about is the garlic and the onions. Awesome. Next question. Okay. This one's an interesting one. What's the best method for planting herbs and composting in an apartment? That's a great question. I go, oops, what happened? I think somebody's not on mute. This is what I would recommend is thinking about containers. Um, you can get so creative with containers. Um, I've talked to a lot of my friends about how they can grow things. And um, if you want to grow something indoors, just be careful. It has a lot of light. But um, container gardening is, is like a whole other subsection of gardening. And there's a ton of great books out there um, about just doing that. So if you're in an apartment, you are not restricted. What you need to think about is... Um, how much light you're getting during the day. So that's an important thing to think about on your patio. Okay, and this is a question from Jayla. Are there other ways to use my food scraps or where to bring them if I don't want to waste everything? messing with me. There we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, so Jayla, I don't know where you live, but uh, vermicomposting is a great thing to look at if you're in an apartment or a small space, if you want to DIY. Um, what TURN does is we allow people to, and that was part of my you know thing in the very beginning, we do the dirty work for people. So if people want to do the right thing, but they don't want to do it themselves. We have different levels of service. So that's what we do. Um, and so I don't want to do like a shameless plug for turn, but check out our website, turncompost.com. Um, we do pick up at doorsteps and they come in these five gallon buckets. Um, and then we also have drop off locations all around DFW, including a partnership with Whole Foods Market. So if that's an option for you is like to pursue a private model. If you're going to do it yourself, um, then I would recommend if you're in a small space, I don't know, Jayla, you can tell me, um, looking into vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is also really fun if you have kids. It's really, it's really, really fun. Okay, let's see. This was a comment from Danielle. I'm looking to plant collard greens now and hoping the peppers produce before freezing temps come. The worms ate my spring crop because I forgot to net them and I don't use insecticides. I hope you get peppers. You know, I had a ton of, um, I have a ton of mites right now on my okra and there are definitely natu natural solutions for that. So Danielle, I totally wish you the best on that. Um, greens from my experience usually have bug problems. <laughs> um, there are different homemade remedies that you can use and organic remedies um, for those things, but I totally wish you good luck, Danielle. I love collard greens um, and they do tend to do very, very well here. Hey, and this is from Lauren. Do you cover your herbs in the winter um, with freeze or bring them inside in a container? Everything that I've shown you guys, I do not cover because they're perennials, they're meant to be outside. Um, unless it's like, for whatever reason, crazy, like five degree temperatures, then I'll cover them. Um, but it's kind of like a matter of like, what do you want to save or what do you not want to save? If I've been growing a rosemary bush for five years and it's gotten to be this big, I definitely want to save that, that baby. Um, 
So I personally do not cover unless it's something that I really care about or it's extremely, extremely cold because again, what I've showed you are things that should make it and have made it for me throughout lots of different um, climate circumstances. So, um, and important thing to know during the winter is to insulate your plants as much as possible with mulch. And that is a huge protectant and again, compost. So that's why they recommend compost in the fall because as much as you can insulate your plants and protect them, um, that's the best remedy for, for extreme weather. Okay, the next question was, what's your experience or recommendation for overwintering peppers? That's a great question. I I have not done that. Uh, I know that's a common thing to do is bring your peppers in. Um, so I've heard great success stories about that. Um, I haven't done it myself. I guess it depends on like how much time do you want to spend and you know how much love and attention they need. Uh, my pepper plant right now is like four feet tall. So and it's, it's in my garden bed. So I'm not going to overwinter and replant it. I'm probably just not going to do that. <laughs> um, but that is absolutely a viable thing to do is over is overwinter and bringing things inside. Um, I don't have the capacity outside for like a little greenhouse or a dome or anything like that. So for me, it's just a toss up as to personally what I want to want to take on. But I think that's a totally exciting thing to do. Anybody else have uh, any last minute questions? We've got a few minutes. Um, I did find the link for um, the Texas AgriLife Fall Vegetable Gardening Guide. So y'all can check that out. Um, we're also having an in-person event at the Skyline Branch about fall garden prep. If you wanna join us for that, I'll put the link in there. That one's in November in a few weeks. Okay, I'm gonna give it one more minute for any questions. Does the city of Dallas do any type of composting program? Let's see, Judy, are you there? Let me see if Judy knows from OEQS. As far as I know, the city of Dallas doesn't have any like city-sponsored city composting program, but let's see. Yeah. I think Danielle can answer that well, one. Danielle's here. We actually don't, but uh, Danielle's actually was on the line and she can definitely answer that one. Um, it's it's being worked on. It's in the works. That's good it's to hear. Works. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah. if you guys um, message your city council members and tell them that that's something that you're interested in, they would love to hear from you. That's a great hit suggestion, Daisy. <laughs> It's my it's my new suggestion when people have complaints that I can't I can't fix in the immediate. I'm like, well, let your council members know. Yes, especially <laughs> since we finished up budget season earlier. I was That's like, right. message your council members. They want to know what you want, what you're interested in. They um, do. That's true. It's easy to do it. Just go to DallasCityHall.com and go to City Council, and they have a link there. You can just reach them. Yeah, and a lot of them have um meetings like at least once a month yes the summer right. at the libraries <laughs> yes okay so it looks like we we don't have any more questions um so i guess we'll wrap up for today uh as a reminder we did record today's program we'll send that link out once it's ready it usually takes about a day or a couple days, just depends. Um, thank you for joining us. Lauren, thank you so much for all of that wonderful information that you shared. I did yes, put the link you, to turn compost in the chat, but I'll also send it with the email that we send afterwards. Thank you for having me today. Good luck, everybody. Happy gardening, happy composting. Enjoy this beautiful weather. Let's get outside more now that we have a relief from the heat. Yes. Very good suggestion. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> thank you. And then a quick update about composting. So this is from Danielle. I can say the sanitation department has hired a consultant to study options. Composting is a strategy that's being pursued in the city's local solid waste management plan. 
To learn more, email dallasrecycles at dallas.gov. That's really exciting. All right, y'all have a great rest of your day.